Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. I'm your host, Sean Carroll, and we're getting good at this now. We're getting used to this, so let's jump right in. Today's big idea is time. Last week, we did space. Today, we're doing time. Probably not a big surprise. But when we did space, we talked about, you know, why there was space at all. Time is a little bit different. Time is also similar to space, right? I mean, we, we live in a post-Einstein universe. We've been we've had that message beaten into us that space and time are both part of one four-dimensional space-time, and yes, that's true and important, but time is also different than space in a lot of ways. So the discussion we're going to have about time is very different than the discussion we're going to have about space. I'm going to be less concerned about why time exists at all with the nature of time. What is it? So with space, that's kind of obvious, right? Space is where other things are located. Time is a bit more mysterious. Despite the word time being the most used noun in the English language and most other languages, I encourage you to listen to the podcast interview I did recently on Mindscape with Lara Boroditsky, who is an expert on the language of time, and she'll talk about how the word time and temporal language is used in different cultures and so forth. Today, we're going to stick to the physics. So, Here's the thing, you know, we have a certain point of view on space and time. They're both similar and different. Why are they similar and different? You know, we talk about space time in the modern world, but Isaac Newton could have talked about space time, right? When we draw these pictures, space time diagrams with time going that way, space down here. Well, space is every slice of a space time diagram, right? So here's X and Y, but every moment of time corresponds to a certain three-dimensional space, okay? So space sort of happens over and over again. You have a particle or something like that that has some trajectory, and there it is when time is that time. Okay, so I've just drawn space-time. I didn't say anything about relativity, Einstein, the speed of light, or anything like that. Isaac Newton could have drawn pictures like this. Maybe he did draw pictures like this. There is certainly a sense in which time very naturally goes along with space. When you want to meet somebody for coffee, you have to say where you're going to meet them, where you are in space, but also when you're going to be there, right? What is the moment of time that you're going to be at the coffee shop? So to find yourself, to do something in the universe requires you to specify the three numbers that tell you where you're going to be in space, and the one number that tells you where you're going to be in time. So there's a very natural way in which there exists space-time. It is four-dimensional. Nevertheless, historically, we did not talk that way. In fact, as far as I can tell, it wasn't until the late 19th century when people began to talk about time in ways similar to space. And it, it wasn't even scientists. Edgar Allan Poe, uh, the poet and short story writer, wrote a weird poem about cosmology called Eureka. That is one of his last works, a, a long definitive statement on how he thought the universe worked. Uh, and he talks in there about how time is a duration and that's very much like space is a distance. And I don't know exactly what his motivation was for doing that, but he said those words. H.G. Wells, of course, in The Time Machine, uh, circa, I think, 1895, definitely talked about time and space as being two sides of the same four-dimensional space-time, so before relativity came along. But it wasn't earlier that, and I do sometimes wonder about whether or not this idea that time is similar to space coming up rather late has something to do with the fact that there aren't a lot of time travel stories in ancient cultures, right? Or in, you know, pre-modern cultures, let's put it that way. There's not a lot of stories about people traveling to other times, whereas now you can't swing a cat without hitting a time travel movie in the theater. I think it's because of this idea that people really didn't think of time, other times, as a place to go right? We didn't think about time in the same way we think about space. So that's what I want to sort of dig into a little bit here. So why is time different than space? Even though it's clearly another place, another number you have to give me to locate yourself. It's also different in various ways. So I'll list a few ways, and then we'll sort of say, well, maybe all of these ways are kind of related to each other. So one way is um, we move through time. Of course, we can move through space also, but we move through time kind of 
whether we like it or not, right? We can choose to travel through space or we can just choose to sit on our butts or there could be a global pandemic that enforces sitting on our butts and not moving through space very much. But pandemic or not, we're going to age. We're going to move through time one second per second, okay? And the reason why I write one second per second, it just seems like obvious tautology, etc. People sometimes ask about the speed at which we move through time, which is just a bad thing to ask. Speed is distance divided by time. Speed by its definition. Velocity, rate, these are a amount of space traversed per unit time. There's no such thing by definition as the rate at which we move through time unless you give it some tautologous notion like one second per second. But the point is, there's an inevitability about it. You can avoid hitting an obstacle that is in your path in space. You cannot avoid hitting tomorrow. That seems to be a feature of time. Another feature is that one moment depends on the next. This is, uh, we're getting a little deeper and more important now. Um, well, on, on the previous one, I should say, the usual way we think about it. What I mean by that is, you know, if I have an object here, here's an Apple Pencil that I use to make these uh, videos, I can be pretty sure that the stuff out of which the pencil is made will still exist one second from now. There's a few, you know, exceptions to that. If a global, if a, you know, if the false vacuum decays or something like that, black hole swallows us up. But roughly speaking, things tend to persist through time. And the more formal way of saying that is, in the Laplacian Newtonian point of view on physics, we can go from what happens at one moment to predict what will happen at the next moment or to retrodict what happened at the previous moment. There is no structure like that for space. The fact that there exists a pencil right here does not tell me anything at all about what is next to it. I can imagine all sorts of spatial configurations with very different things from one point to another. So this dependence that we have through time distinguishes time from space. Another feature is that somehow we think the past is settled. The past already happened, right? And it's, again, the language that we have that was not invented to talk scientifically or philosophically about time. The language comes from ordinary use. Embedded into this language is a very definite notion of how time works, so it's hard even to say it out loud. But the past is settled, whereas the future is up for grabs. I'm intentionally being casual about that. The future hasn't happened yet, but we have a feeling that we can affect the future. We have a feeling that there are choices we could make that could have an influence over what happens next. Or even if it's not put in personal anthropocentric terms, we have a feeling that there are causes or events right hap that happen right now at one moment that have an impact on effects in the future. Causes precede effects. We don't think that anything we can do right now or choose to do right now can change the past, okay? And I know there's some free will skeptics out there that says nothing you can do now can change the future either. So put that aside for the moment. What I mean is, we, what I'm not trying to do here is describe the reality. What I'm trying to do here is describe our impressions, okay? We talk a language that says, I can choose to watch this video or not. I can choose to make this video or not. I could choose to do various things, but only toward the future. We only speak a language of causal influence over the future. Whereas we think the past is done. There's nothing we can do to affect it. We can have memories of it. We can have records. We can have photographs. We can have artifacts, fossils, history books, and so forth. None of which we have about the future. So this, there seems to be this imbalance. Um, whereas, so this is a difference between time and space because there's nothing like that in space. There's nothing like that about my location here in space that draws a huge distinction between left and right in the same way that my location in time draws a huge distinction between past and future. So all of these together, I think what we can do is add them up to the question. Uh, let's put it this way. I was gonna say, is time real? But that's begging a certain question. Are other times real? Do they really exist? So what I mean is, forget about like the 
deep down definition of what reality is. We're not going to get that philosophical right now. Let's imagine there's a sense in which I truly believe that there's something called the room next door and there's stuff in it and that's real. Okay, let's get that again. It's a it's the folk notion. It's the informal everyday notion. Nothing very, very sophisticated. We have a different notion when it comes to time. We don't have any controversy over the reality of what's at other locations in space, but we treat other times as something that may or may not be sensibly considered as real. Is the past real? Is the future real? Are they as real as the present? These are all good open questions. So you won't be surprised to learn that different people have different attitudes about these questions, and basically all the possibilities have their defenders. I'm not going to go into a sort of a full detailed account of all the different possible ways you can answer this question, are other times real? There's the question. Uh, but let's focus on the two big obvious ones. One is called presentism. And the other is called eternalism. Sometimes this is called the block universe perspective. And the basic idea here, you can guess from what I've already said and from the labels, what is going on here. A presentist says, if this is your space-time diagram and this is one particular moment, here's space, here are people in space doing things. A presentist is going to say, this is what's real. The future, everything up here, and the past, everything down there, not real. Not real yet, you would say, about the future, or not real anymore, you would say, about the past. We're not denying that they were real or will be real, but we're saying when we talk about what the world is, as a presentist, we say the world is the stuff that exists right now. That is the world. That is reality. This stuff that exists right now occurs over and over again in slightly different configurations, things move, okay? So we use time to label the different manifestations, the different instantiations, appearances of the world, but at any one moment, just that one moment is what is real. And this distinction between past, present, and future is really, really deep and important and of central importance to metaphysics and, and philosophy and reality and physics and science and all of those things. Whereas an eternalist will draw the same space-time diagram. So here's time, here's a certain moment of space, there's a person, okay, there's time. But they will say, look, the whole thing is just as real, okay? There's no difference in eternalism between the past, the, between the reality, at least, of uh, the past, present, and future. So I'm not drawing it very well, but the idea is that there is a four-dimensional block. Do, 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 do. And there it is. And past, present, and future are all equally real to an eternalist. So an eternalist says, the only thing special about the present moment is that it is the present moment to you. There are past moments. Here's a past moment. And there's an immense temptation to say, the past is still real, <laughs> or the past is real now, or the present and past are real at the same time. None of those is the right way of saying it. It's not that the past is still real, it's just the past is real. That's it, that's what you say. The future is real. There's no difference in the levels of reality, according to an eternalist or to a block universe person, between the past, present, and future, okay? And you might very well wonder who cares. That's a perfectly fair question to ask about this. But, let, but let's imagine that we care about the difference between these two things, and then we'll offer some reasons to think either one. But again, I'm not here to tell you the final answer about this. I'm an eternalist. I'm a block universe person, and I'll mention offhandedly some of the reasons why. But really, I want you to be thinking about the existence of this question. There is also, by the way... Um, uh, another point of view, I'll draw this other point of view and then I will erase it because it's just sort of a curiosity. Um, you can say, well, you can take seriously this idea that time is going forward and the past is fixed, the past is in the books, but the future is up for grabs, and say, okay, what that means to me is that the past is real, but not the future. So I can say, here's what's real. 
not yet real up here. This is called the growing block universe. And it's a perfectly respectable position. But I think once you've gone all the way to saying the past is real, why not include the future as well? <laughs> so these are, the, these are various options that are on the table, but I'm not going to belabor um, all the different. There's more than this. Believe me, there's many, many more that you could imagine being converted to. OK, so why? You know, what, are the, what are the different aspects of this? What are the different features of it? Um, these are ancient perspectives, you know, and, and I'm not going to, I'm hesitating here talking because this way of slicing the options into presentism and eternalism is very closely related to some other ways of slicing, but not exactly the same as, and I'm going to smush them all together. I'm not going to be very careful about distinguishing between what we talk about here. But um, roughly speaking, this is Heraclitus. If you go back to ancient Greek thinking about philosophy and physics, Heraclitus was the ancient Greek philosopher who emphasized the primacy of change. What is important is change. And so Heraclitus makes the point that um, if you think about a river, okay, and you say, what is real? And you might say, well, there's a river. And then you come back the next day. It's the same river. There it is. And Heraclitus says, no, no, no. It's a totally different river. It's a, it's a river that is at a different moment in time. The atoms, he wouldn't know about the atoms, but the water has moved. There's slight differences in the nature of the river. There's a completely different thing going on as far as Heraclitus is concerned. Change and flux are what are really important. Parmenides is uh, the guy who's held up as the anti-Heraclitus, Parmenides says, there is no such thing as change. There is an eternal reality. These roughly, roughly, roughly map onto uh, presentism and eternalism. And more recently, there is a guy named, uh, what's his, what is his name? John Ellis McTaggart. I knew his last name, but not his first name. So I'm trying to write down the first name so I don't forget them, like poor Joseph Louis Lagrange, whose name I always forget. So McTaggart uh, has what he calls the A theory of time and the B theory of time. McTaggart was a philosopher in the early 20th century, and his point was to argue that time was not real, <laughs> that, the, that the very notion of time was self-contradictory. So he had a, an A series and a B series. The A series was thinking of time centered on the present moment. So you think of time as now, future, and past. This is the tensed theory of time, or tensed way of talking about it, past, present, future. And this is the tenseless theory of time, because if you want, you can just put a coordinate on the time coordinate of the universe, you know, going from zero at the Big Bang to 14 billion years now to the future, and you can label different moments in time by their time coordinate. But this notion of past, present, and future is not central to the conception of what time is. And McTaggart has a bunch of arguments, he says, Clearly the B theory is wrong, clearly the A theory is right, but then he says the A theory is mutually, is internally incoherent, so it can't be right either. Therefore, there's no such thing as time. His famous paper is called The Unreality of Time. So I think that's a little silly, that particular conclusion. Uh, I'm certainly not doing justice, so any pro mctaggatarians -McTag out there, uh, sorry about that. The, the question of whether time is real, let me just brush over it very quickly. Of course time is real. Come on, give me a break. <laughs> Everyone in the world uses time all the time. You can have a more sophisticated point of view where you say that maybe time is not fundamental. Maybe it emerges from something more important. But you can't say that time is not real. There's a temptation even among block universe people, especially among block universe people like myself, uh, to say, well, if every moment of time is equally real, then time is not real. Time is just an illusion. The idea that we flow through time, that we move it, or that time moves around us, moves past us, those can't be right if the universe is eternal and real, at equally real at every single moment. But that's just crazy talk. At every single moment, I, the person that is me at that moment 
does divide the universe into past, present, and future. That person knows perfectly well what it means to say your TV show comes on at 8 p.m. I used to say the movie came on at 8 p.m., but now that we're all under lockdown, we watch our TV shows at 8 p.m. Using time in a very pragmatic, uh, everyday way is clearly necessary. And for me, that's more than enough to say that time is real. It's not an illusion. It might not be fundamental. There might be a better, deeper, more um, comprehensive way of talking about the notion that we talk about time, especially when, once we get to quantum mechanics and quantum cosmology and so forth. But obviously, time is real. Give me a break. Okay. So I'm not very pro Um Having said that, let me put a footnote on that. Um, there is something to Heraclitus's point of view, where he says the river tomorrow is not the same as the river today. And this drives home, especially when we start talking about personal identity. Forget about the identity of the river. What about ourselves, right? Um, we certainly have a very strong feeling that it makes sense to talk about who I was a day ago or a year ago, right? There's something called me, and that person has an extent through time. I might have changed, but there is a me-ness, an identity that flows through time from the past to the future. That's, again, a very, very strong feeling that we have. If you're really strict about it as an eternalist, what you would say is what really exists is me now, me at a certain time of day, but there's another thing that exists, which is me as I was a day ago or a year ago. These are different things because they're at different locations in time. There's a relationship between them, just like there's a relationship between different atoms, different molecules in the Apple Pencil here, okay? But that doesn't mean that they're an identity in and of themselves at a fundamental level, right? We can choose to separate out the different atoms and think about them in different ways. They are, they have a separate identity. Likewise, I would argue, we can choose to treat me now and me a year ago and me five years ago as different things. The reason why, some of you will know, the reason why I care about this particular issue is because when it comes to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, there will not only be me's at different moments of time, but there will be me's in different branches of the wave function. And those are different me's. They're not me. There's not the same person. You know, they're separated just as my identical twin would be a different person, even though we came from the same egg. Okay. But they share a relationship. And so I think that once you get sophisticated about the notion of personal identity through time, you understand that it's about relationships, not about some metaphysical essence that passes from moment to moment. And the same is true about different copies of you in different branches of the wave function of the universe. Okay. Why would anybody be tempted to go into this uh, crazy view that all times are created equal when I have this strong feeling from my everyday experience that now is what really exists? Well, the answer is because the laws of physics don't distinguish between different times. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how best to put this. Uh, the word distinguish is doing a lot of work there. But the laws of physics don't distinguish between different times. Time appears in the laws of physics, okay? We talked about in the Newtonian paradigm, uh, you give me the initial conditions, the position, velocity, or position, and momentum, and I can chug through time. I can evolve the particle or the set of particles forward or backward. So, but the, what, the, what appears, if I, if I write F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration, well, acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. There it is, time appearing in the equation. But what appears is the notion of time, not any one particular time. So this is the rate of change of velocity as time passes. But this equation is the same equation at every moment of time. Okay, that's what it means to say the laws of physics do not distinguish between different moments of time. They do not pick out a preferred moment of time. Just like when we were talking about Galilean relativity, there's no location in space that is picked out. There's no velocity, no inertial frame of reference that is picked out. There is no time that is picked out either. So the laws of physics don't point to now as anything special in the world. They treat the universe as more or less the same at every moment. The laws um, treat it more or less equally at every moment of time. The 
argument that you should treat all moments of time equally becomes even stronger when relativity comes along. And this is cheating, because we haven't talked about relativity yet. But in relativity, uh, I'll just tell you one feature of it. If you were to draw a space-time diagram, x and t, okay, Einstein says, unlike Newton, who said space exists, time exists, and they're separate, Einstein says space and time both exist as part of four-dimensional space-time. Why does he want to say that? I I'm hesitating because he didn't want to say that. When he first invented what we now know as special relativity, when he first put it in this final form, there were other people like Lorenz and Poincaré and uh, Fitzgerald and other who contributed to it. Um, he didn't like the idea that you should think about special relativity in terms of space-time. That was an invention by Minkowski, Minkowski, if you want to be German about it, uh, Hermann Minkowski, who was actually Einstein's professor, right, older than Einstein. It was Minkowski who was a mathematician who said there's a nice mathematical formalism that lets you think about Einstein's special theory of relativity in terms of a single four-dimensional space-time. And he went on to advocate this quite strongly. Einstein was initially reluctant to go that far. He had some equations. They worked. That's all he needed. Of course, by the time 10 years later, when he was inventing general relativity, the idea of space-time was absolutely crucial, so he did accept it. Um, but anyway, the point here, this is special relativity. Forget about general relativity. So this is 1905. And what between Einstein and Minkowski, what they realized was the splitting of space-time into moments of constant time, which we then call space, is not absolute is not built in to the laws of nature. It depends on the perspective of an observer. So implicitly, when you draw this picture of space-time as I drew it, you're imagining this is what is observed by an observer that is basically stationary from this perspective, that is staying at the same uh, location in space. If you had an observer that was moving at some velocity, then they would, t if you ask them the question, what are moments of equal time, moments of simultaneity all throughout space, then if your observer is doing something like this, okay, here's a different observer. This is the weird part. They don't rotate the axes like you would on a Euclidean plane, otherwise it would just be space we were talking about, but because it's space-time, they say that a constant moment of time looks like this. So they would say, this is, call it T prime. Here, I'll be nice to you. I will make a different color. So here's this observer moving along this trajectory, and they would call this T prime and they would call this x prime. And so this set of points of space time are to the moving observer, what they would think of as the universe at one moment in time. In other words, the way that we take space time and divide it up into moments of time is not built in to the fabric of reality. It depends on the perspective of an observer. But a presentist, someone who thinks that only the present moment is real has a problem with this, right? I mean, if you thought only the present moment is real, whose present moment is it that is real? Presentists are very stubborn and very clever and they have figured out ways to deal with this, but I would say, I, I would not be a presentist even if it were just Newtonian physics, but I could get it. I mean, I could appreciate the importance of it. But once you're into relativity, being a presentist is very, very difficult. Dividing up the universe is a human construction. Dividing up the universe into moments of time. It doesn't seem to be something that is really has a lot of metaphysical oomph about the nature of reality, okay? So once relativity comes along, sensible people become eternalists in that way. And okay, we're still, okay, that, that's a little argument in favor of eternalism, but, you know, we still feel this difference between space and time, and so we're still a little bit reluctant to actually dive in to this eternalist perspective. And I find that in these situations where there's there's a question of, you know, reality or philosophy or whatever face, facing us as people who care about physics, it helps to operationalize. It helps to actually say what really happens in the world, that, that what do we get out of talking about the world one way or the other. I'm not against 
thinking metaphysically about these questions. I think it's crucially important to do so. I think the whole point of science is to understand what is happening really. What is what is the best language and, and formalism we have for grasping reality and asking what is real is, is an important part of that. But we can become, uh, we can break anchor, right? We can get unmoored from reality unless we bring our language back into questions about what do we see, what happens, what can we touch, what becomes tangible. So let's think about how we measure time. Well, we know, right, how we measure time is through clocks. What is a clock? Clock is something that measures time. <laughs> So it seems a little bit circular. What do we mean by a clock? You know, when we have space, it's a little bit more obvious, right? We, we build something, some object that has some integrity that doesn't change that much over time. And we say, this is a standard unit of measure, like a ruler, okay? Uh, like a measuring rod. So very often in relativity, people will be talking about rods and clocks. The rod they mean is a ruler, something that has a fixed length, and you can put a certain number of them next to each other to measure the distance between something. <sighs> clocks are a little bit more subtle. I mean, things change with time, but things change with time in different ways. How do you know what counts as a clock and what is just changing in some arbitrary way? So a clock is something that changes reliably and predictably with time. Okay, but what does that mean? Well, what it means is that clocks are things that change reliably and predictably with respect to other clocks. Still seems like cheating, I know, but in this case it's not. It becomes not cheating. What do I mean? How could this not be cheating? How could this not be circular? The point is, our universe is full of clocks. There are things in the universe that do change in predictable ways, especially in repetitive ways, right? The most obvious one in the world is, here is the sun rising in the east, okay? There's the landscape, my drawing skills, you know, but okay, the sun rises in the east, etc. We know that the earth rotates around its axis and it revolves around the sun, and we know furthermore that these happen in a repetitive, predictable way with respect to each other. You might, you know, you might be tempted to say, how many times does the earth rotate around its axis every time it revolves around the sun? And you might say, well, 365, that's the number of days in a year. But that's not exactly right, of course. So there is such a thing called leap year, right? Because it's really 365.25 uh, times that you see the sun go up and go down. Uh, therefore, you have to add a day every four years because it's roughly a quarter of a, of a year extra that it takes, quarter of a day extra that it takes. But it's worse than that because if you think about it, if the sun, if the earth were not rotating at all, if it were only revolving around the sun, you would still see the sun go up and down once per year, right? So zero rotations still means one cycle of the sun. And that's the difference between a solar day, which is how long it is between the sun going up and returning to the same spot in the sky, and what is called a sidereal day. So a sidereal day is the, is the time it takes the Earth to rotate with respect to the rest of the universe, with respect to the fixed stars, if you want to put it that way. And because of that extra day, it turns out that it is 366 rotations of the Earth every time it revolves once around the sun, 366.25 sidereal days. Okay, anyway, the point is it's predictable, right? The first clocks came to us from astronomy, from looking at the sky and seeing how long it took things to happen. So the fact that there are two things going on, the rotation of the Earth and the revolution of the Earth around the Sun, is enough to say there are clocks. And in fact, the universe is full of clocks. Atoms and nuclei make the best clocks, but a pretty good clock comes from a pendulum, right? So if you have a ceiling, and you tie something to the ceiling by a rope or something like that, so you put some heavy object on it, this can rock back and forth. And it turns out that the length of the rope does matter to how long it rocks, 
but the amplitude does not. So if you have one of these pendulums and you nudge it just a little bit and let it rock back and forth and ask how long does it take to rock back and forth, then you take the same exact pendulum and push a little bit more, so it's, ro it's rocking back and forth more, it takes the same amount of time. The pendulum will move faster, but because it's going further, it takes the same amount of time. So there's something called the frequency of the pendulum that as long as it keeps at the same length, you're going to be more or less constant. This was figured out by Galileo, one of our heroes, obviously, in this series. And the legend, I'm not sure how true this is, the legend was he was going to church like any good Pisan young boy, uh, but he was bored, so he looked at the chandelier in the church going back and forth, and he timed it using his heartbeat, using his pulse, and he noticed that on different days, depending on uh, the, you know, they would have to lower the chandeliers to light the candles, they didn't have electric lights, so they would lower the chandeliers, pull them back up, and as they, after they would pull them back up, there would be a little oscillation to the chandelier, Galileo says that the period is more or less constant. Now, of course, this is a physicist pendulum. So I'll say approximately constant. There is air resistance and stuff like that. But more or less, pendulums with relatively small oscillations are good clocks. That's why pendulums appear in grandfather clocks and things like that. A mechanical wristwatch has a little spring that goes back and forth, oscillates very, very quickly at a predictable rate. That's what makes it a good clock. So the universe is full of clocks. With respect to each other, they can um, tick off moments of time, and that is how we measure it. Now, I should say, parenthetically, not all clocks are repetitive, right? There are, there's such things as an hourglass. You just take the hourglass, flip it over. You know that it's going to take a certain amount of time to go down, but it doesn't automatically flip itself. It doesn't do the same thing over and over again. I used to believe that in the brain, there were all sorts of oscillations at different frequencies that helped us uh, keep time. I, I think that's not right. I believe from talking to neuroscientists that what happens in the brain to actually give us the ability to measure short intervals of time is something closer to an hourglass than to an oscillating clock back and forth. We have various things going on in our brain where a lot of charge builds up and sort of if it builds up enough, it will collapse and that happens over a certain interval of time. So there's a fascinating relationship between physicist time and psychological time. We're not going to get into that very deeply here, but it is an obvious question to ask. You know, are, we are full of clocks. They're more like hourglasses than, than pendulums or springs, but we, we can feel time passing. It seems to us that under different circumstances, we feel time passing at different rates. Why is that? Is that something about time? Is it something about consciousness? Uh, you know, because it's psychology and neuroscience, these questions are much harder than physics questions are, so we don't know the final answers. But there's been a lot of interesting work done. You know, one famous experiment was done by David Eagleman, a neuroscientist. He is fascinated by the idea that when we're in danger, when the adrenaline is pumping through us and, you know, we're in high-intensity situations, time seems to slow down. So he did an experiment. Uh, he wanted to test this idea by throwing people out of buildings. So in other words, you have a tall building, here's a person standing there, and you, psychologist, neuroscientist, you push them off. And then they fall down, and they land, and you ask, is their experience of time somehow different because they're scared of dying? Now, if you're a good psychologist, you get approval from the review board, and you put a trampoline or something down here so they're safe. And that's what he did. So what Eagleman did was, what he wanted to see was, is it true that as the adrenaline is flowing through you, etc., you literally speed up, okay? Is it possible that time seems to flow more slowly when we're in these high intensity situations because we're moving more quickly? So there are more ticks of our clock than there are of an ordinary, well-calibrated wristwatch or something like that. So what he did was he built a little machine where people could see flashing lights and they would flash at a certain speed and the speed could be so fast you couldn't perceive what was going on or it could be slow enough that you could just get enough information to perceive what was going on. And this was a quick enough experiment that you could literally do it while you were falling onto the trampoline or onto the big puppy thing that will protect you at the bottom of the building. The answer is 
No, you do not speed up. You are not, your ability to discern small moments of time does not seem to be any better, even when your adrenaline is flowing and you're falling off the building, than it is when you're sitting still in a psychology laboratory. Instead, what seems to happen is that in these high intensity situations, you accumulate more memories. You have a very vivid feeling, sensorium, about what is going on around you. And it's not that in the moment time slows down, it's that retrospectively it seems to have taken longer. It seems, and this is other research that uh, points in the same direction, but again, I'm not going to say it's absolutely true, but it seems that our retrospective feeling about how long something took is related to the novelty and the number of new memories we accumulate over time. So you can get bored, like you can be on a long airplane flight and it can seem to stretch forever exactly because nothing is happening. It's just the same thing over and over again. There is no novelty. But in retrospect, you don't have a feeling that it seemed to be a long amount of time because nothing new was happening. This is, this is supposed to um, also perhaps explain why time seems to go faster when you're older, right? Like when you're young, the summer seem to stretch out forever. When you're older, it seems to go re by really quickly because you're seeing less novelty when you're older, because you've been to the beach before when you're older, n fewer new memories are being accumulated, so time seems to pass more quickly. Again, I don't want to be too definitive about this because no one is, and I'm not an expert on them, but the point is our psychological appreciation of time is something that is related to, but still very, very different from the physical notion of time passing. Okay, so that was certainly an aside. Oops. So, but let me go back to the pendulum then, because there's something I want to say about it, which is, imagine you make a movie of the pendulum, okay? Imagine you have the pendulum going back and forth, you make a movie of it, and someone plays the movie and for you, and you say, yes, there you go, pendulum, and they say to you, aha, I tricked you, I was playing the movie backwards, right? If you have a perfect physicist pendulum where there's no air resistance, it just rocks back and forth with the same amplitude forever, and you could play it backwards and no one would ever know because a movie of a backwards going pendulum looks exactly the same as the movie of a forward going pendulum. That is a reflection of the fact that the laws of physics, not only do they not distinguish between different moments of time, but the laws of physics treat past and future equivalently. In other words, if you changed time as your coordinate in different moments of moments, uh, different moments of the history of the universe, if you change time to minus time, the laws of physics would not change. The laws of physics would be invariant under that distinction. From the Laplacian point of view, if you know what's going on at one moment of time, this is why you can chug forward in time or backward in time equally well. Now we know that this idea that the past and future are equivalent is utterly incompatible with our everyday notions of time, with our everyday experience of time. That's not what we feel, right? Like we already said, the past seems to be embedded, done, finished, untouchable, the future seems to be up for grab, something that hasn't happened yet, something that is malleable and changeable. This is something called, dramatic reveal, the arrow of time. You were waiting for this the whole time, I know. The arrow of time is simply a catch-all phrase for all the different ways in which the past and future are different from each other. Despite the fact the laws of physics treat past and future equally, equivalently, there is in our everyday experience of the world a huge difference between past and future. So one obvious example of this is you have to work really hard to find a pendulum that is good enough that if you made a movie of it and played it backwards, no one would know, right? Most things you do in the universe, if you take a movie of them and play them backwards, everyone knows. If you take a movie of an egg breaking or someone falling into a swimming pool or a plant growing or cars driving down the street and you played those movie backwards, those movies backward, everyone would instantly know that you had reversed the direction of time. We were younger, we all grow older, we all remember the past, we all, etc. We experience the past and future very, very differently. That's the arrow of time. Back in the day, before Newtonian physics came along, there was no one who wondered 
about the arrow of time because they were mostly presentists, right? They mostly thought that the what is real, that the real world is a three-dimensional space with stuff in it. Time is just a way of talking about what happens. Physics comes along and says, number one, actually, it's probably better to think in terms of space and time as being kind of similar things, ways of locating yourself in the universe. And number two, the laws of physics don't distinguish between moving forward and moving backward in time. Now there's a puzzle about the arrow of time. Where does it come from? Okay. Well, I will tell you the answer. I will tell you my favorite answer, um, but we'll have to talk about it more to get um, into details. And guess what? We have more videos ahead of us in which we can talk about it. So the basic answer is entropy. Entropy is very roughly speaking, a measure of the disorderliness, the randomness in a collection of stuff. So if you have a box of gas, and all of the molecules of the gas are somehow in the corner and there's just vacuum all around them, this is low entropy. This is not very random. Whereas if you have a box of gas and all the molecules of gas are randomly distributed throughout the box, this is high entropy. And it will not surprise you to learn that in closed systems, entropy increases. Almost. Really, entropy never decreases all by itself, is, is this rule which we call the second law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is just that energy is conserved. You knew that already. So the second law of thermodynamics, entropy tends to increase in closed systems. At least it doesn't go down. Things go from more orderly to less orderly. That is a, a law, look, it says law right there. It's a law of physics that does tell the difference between the past and the future. So how could I say the laws of physics treat past and future equivalently? Clearly the second law of thermodynamics does not. So this is the project of people like Ludwig Boltzmann in the 1870s, the, the 19th century more generally. Uh, Maxwell and Thompson and other people, Gibbs, contributed to this idea. But they, what they wanted to do was to reconcile this idea that the laws of physics treat past and future equivalently, which is what is handed down to us by Newtonian dynamics, by the laws of classical mechanics, with this idea that in fact there's a macroscopic feature of the world where the difference between past and future is hugely important. And roughly speaking, the answer is this, that the right way to think, think about phase space. Okay, think about for some system with maybe a large number of particles, there's a large number of things that could happen Roughly speaking, there are positions and there are momenta. I'll put them in little braces to let you know this is for many, many particles at once. And when you look at a system, like when you look at a cup of coffee with cream and coffee, is a classic example, you don't see precisely what point of phase space it's in because you can't see every molecule that is in the cream or the coffee. You see some coarse grained features. You see some incomplete information, okay? So what Boltzmann says is, what we're going to do with the entire phase space is be honest. We're going to say, I can't see exactly where in phase space this system is. What I'm going to do is I'm going to divide phase space up into what are called macro states. And a macro state is a collection of many, many different points in phase space that all look the same to me macroscopically. So if I change around the arrangement of the molecules of cream or the molecules of coffee so as to still keep the macroscopic appearance of the cup of coffee the same, then I'm in the same macro state. And I can imagine there's different macro states sort of embedded inside each other where the cream and the coffee are mixing together more and more thoroughly. And then he says the entropy is just the size of the macro state. In other words, the more micro states are in a macro state, the bigger the entropy is. I left some room here because technically it's the logarithm of the size of the macro state. I'm not going to tell you what a logarithm is, but you can look it up. But anyway, it's a, it's a measure of the size of the macro state. So 
basically, uh, a macro state which is very tiny is low entropy because there aren't that many ways to arrange things to look like that. A macro state where there are many, many arrangements that look exactly the same is high entropy. This is the formalization of the idea intuitively that entropy is a measure of disorderliness. Really, entropy is a measure of the number of indistinguishable microstates that are members of that macro state. So Boltzmann says, now I can tell you why entropy tends to increase. Because if entropy is the size of the macro state, if I start, let me change colors, if I start in a very low entropy macro state and I just let things go, I just let the system evolve without directing it in any way, it will almost inevitably, and you can do the math, it's extremely, extremely likely, the system will evolve into a bigger macro state. Entropy will tend to go up. So that's crucially important because on the one hand, he is reconciling the Newtonian dynamics of the microstate with the apparent fact that entropy increases. But on the other, he's saying that the second law is not really a law. It's possible that just by your random wanderings, you will find yourself going from high entropy into low entropy. It's just really, really unlikely. Okay, so the second law is a statistical law, but if you, again, if you run the numbers, once the number of atoms or molecules in your system is bigger than 100, the chances that you dramatically decrease in entropy are infinitesimally tiny in the age of the universe. So there's good news, bad news here. Uh, the good news is we have explained why um, the entropy increases over time, despite the fact that the underlying laws of physics are completely reversible or completely agnostic about past versus future. The bad news is there are two big questions that are left over, okay? I, what, we, what Boltzmann explained was, so here are the open questions. What Boltzmann explained was why entropy would tend to increase if you start in a low entropy state. Why do you start in a low entropy state? Now, there's a little bit of a cheat here, because um, I use the word start. Ex post facto, if you have at one end of time a low entropy state and at the other end of time a high entropy state, you will always define the past to be the direction of lower entropy. So it's not that you start with low entropy, it's that there is low entropy at all at any point on your trajectory. Because if you think about it, if you find yourself in this picture in this medium entropy state, okay, and you didn't know anything else, if you didn't know what the past was like or what the future was like, the simplest way, simplest trajectory, the most likely trajectory to live on is one that goes to a future higher entropy state, but also one that came from a past higher entropy state. So if all you had was Boltzmann's division of phase space up into macro states, you would say, well, both the past and the future are equally higher entropy, most likely. We don't think that's true. We think that in the real world, there was a lower entropy beginning. And so the name for that idea is the past hypothesis, that we started with a low entropy state. Why do we call it a hypothesis? What might it be true? Future video, we'll talk about that. We're not gonna talk about it right now. But this is an open question, and it's a question for cosmology. The universe began in a low entropy state 14 billion years ago. Nobody knows why. That's an open question. The other open question is, are, are all manifestations of the arrow of time versions of the arrow of time explicable or explained by increasing entropy? So I said, so I think the answer to this one is yes. <laughs> Therefore, I will sometimes just say as if it's true, but you know, to be fair, it's not uh, proven. We're not sure that this is true. There, are, remember, I mentioned different manifestations of the arrow of time. I can causally affect things in the future, but not the past. I can remember the past, but not the future. We were all little babies in the past. We'll all be wrinkly old people in the future. There's many different versions of the arrow of time, psychological, etc. I claim that all of them are because of the second law of thermodynamics, that ultimately the second law of thermodynamics, the fact that entropy is increasing, underlies 
or grounds uh, all of the different versions of the second of the arrow of time. But we haven't proven that. We haven't shown that. This is ongoing research. So for those of you out there who are interested in the nature of time, um, there's a lot to be done, right? I mean, what time is, we haven't even touched on. We sort of use the everyday notion that the label on points in the universe, just as for space, you can get deeply into quantum gravity and, and ask about whether it's emergent. Likewise, you can do that for time. But even if you accept what time is as a smooth parameter that tells you when you are in the universe, there are still these huge open questions. Why was the entropy so low? Is the change of entropy enough to explain all of the different versions of the arrow of time? We'll say more about this uh, in later videos, but still the point here is that it's an open question. There's a lot about time that we have yet to understand.